Pokemon Pocket is the latest and greatest Pokemon game released, and as someone who hadn't done much with the TCG before, I'm loving it. After the Pokemon Sleep Nuzlocke, I figured I could do something similar, and work my way through a Nuzlocke using Pocket. So, how am I gonna do that? Well, we still have the normal rules. If a Pokemon faints, it's dead forever, and so on. But, I have a couple extra this time around. One, I can only use basic cards until I get their evolved forms. I could use Bulbasaur if I pull it, but I can't evolve it until I pull Ivysaur. And I can't use Venusaur if I only pull Venusaur. Two, I'll be opening two packs for every major event of the game, which is mostly just the gyms. And that sounds like a lot, but dupes and unusable Pokemon are an issue. Three, since I'm playing Shield, if I pull a full art, I could Dynamax that Pokemon. And if it's an EX, I could Gigantamax it if applicable. And four, I won't be using Legendaries, but to keep their value, I could trade their cards for a different card that I'd like. If it's a Legendary EX, I could trade it for two cards. Whew, okay, are we good? If not, then the list of rules will be in the description as always. Otherwise, let's begin. To simulate picking a starter, I'll be using the Wonder Pick feature. RNG could be a little annoying, but Wonder Pick gives you a whole 20% chance to pick the card you want. There are some pretty fun options here, like a Full Art Lapras, but I should pick one with multiple decent basics. I end up picking New Ones Pack, because an early game Heatmore or Hitmonlee could carry. But once I make my pick, I end up getting Ralts. Hate to say it, but it's too weak to fight until it evolves, so I'll be opening Mewtwo packs for a while. That's the only place I could get the Ralts line. So, it's pack opening time. Oh yeah, now that's a bent rap. Sanchiru, Bisharp for later. Oh -ho -ho -ho. Ponyta, Tynemo isn't in this game, and... Oh yeah, <laughs> nothing to it. Just one of the three rarest cards in the game. G-Max Pikachu is super nice for the early game. For pack two, I couldn't find any bend, so I chose the one that was already facing backwards. I pull Ponyard, Krabby, Dubwool, Bruxish, and Golduck. Bruxish isn't in this game, but getting Ponyard and Krabby right away is pretty nice. So finally we make it to the game. And I know this team looks a little stacked with this rule set, but just remember that Pawnerp is the only one allowed to evolve right now. And that's not until level 52. With Pawnerp and Crabbler teaming up, the first two battles against Hop go by pretty smoothly. And Pawnerp handles the entire fight against Bead. Though I wasn't expecting Solosis to use Endeavor, Pawnerp carries. Speaking of carry, Pondashi charges in to fight Milo. A couple flame charges do the trick for Gossiflor, and when the Eldegoss comes in and Dynamaxes, we protect their first max overgrowth. Of course, now if they use max strike off of Swift, Pondashi won't take it nearly as well. But for some reason, Milo just uses another max overgrowth. And as we protect their third turn, he does it again. Huh. With them back to normal size and the grassy terrain slowly healing us, Pondashi easily spams a couple more flame charges and wins us an oddly free first gym badge. Another round of card openings quickly brings me a Clavopus, Farfetch'd, and Rhydon, hopefully for later, as well as an Ivysaur, uh, Eevee, Yo, Heebor? And Whimsicott. Forget the Eevee, Peek just entered the team. The run is saved. Clavoloct is now my go-to answer for any team yell interaction I have. Peekmore incinerates Hop's whole team until Pawnirp deals with the Drizzile, and then it's time to take on Nessa. Even though I pulled a crown rare of one of the strongest pocket meta picks, Pikachu will need a little boost to take on Nessa. And if he still isn't enough then... <laughs> I don't know who will be. Pikachu leads in Gym 2, and with the looming threat of Nessa's Dreadnought, I consider delaying our G-Max. Unfortunately, even with the magnet boosting our electric type attacks, even Coldine has a chance to live. So we commit to fat time and immediately take them out with a G-Max Volt Crash. Right before Aracuda hits us with an Aqua Jet, and then falls to the same move. We're in a minor predicament now. Once Dreadnought Dynamaxes, we won't be able to one-shot them. Pikachu may be fat, but fat enough to live a hit? He's still just a Pikachu after all. I, I don't really have any other option, so we stay in. Pikachu outspeeds the Dreadnought to do about 65% to them with the G-Max Volt Crash. Even though they get parried, they retaliate with a Max Darkness off of Bite. That we take pretty well, actually. Our G-Max does end after that turn, but thanks to the para, Pikachu still ends up winning the fat fight, and one Electro Ball easily finishes them off. 
I think I finally understand what it means to be pay to win. The next couple of packs could very well be the most important of the game. Kabu is known to be a run ender for those underprepared, and I just might be one of those. Sadly, there's no bend in my next deck, but I do end up pulling a Dratini, Salanda, and Dragonite. Okay, okay, I have some time to pull a Dragonair. I did find a nice Crinkle in the next pack, and pulled a pretty nice selection. Wulu can evolve right away thanks to the double from earlier, and Ghastly is an option, but sadly I won't be able to use Heliolisk, Tenacruel, or Golbad just yet. Warming up for the Kabu fight, Peekmore takes on Bead. But it wasn't a great warm up, because Peekmore is in fact Peek, and Bead couldn't handle the heat. I'm not gonna lie though, I was a little underprepared for Marnie. It cut close, but this time I was carried by the teamwork of Wubwu, Peekmore, and Crabbler. I feel like a lot of people forget about Crabbler, so I'm here to remind you. Don't forget about Crabbler. Back to Kabu, I didn't really get the pulls I was looking for, so this uphill battle has gotten steeper. However, I still have one more carry in the back pocket that the entire run will be resting on. Sandsrash. More than anything, we need to deal with the Scorch, and Ninetales missing their Will-O-Wisp to let us set up Stealth Rocks was very generous. They give up on the Burn Dream and attack us, but since it's just Ember, we could live and retaliate with Bulldoze. They're still faster, but their next Will-O-Wisp gets cancelled out by our held Lumberry. Yeah, we were prepared. Another Bulldoze then gets the kill. Of course, if the Ninetales played more aggressively, or just landed their first Willow, Sandtrash would very likely be dead by now. But with my current selection of Vons, I sadly didn't have a choice but to risk it. But Arcanine is a physical attacker, so Sandtrash just might live. Stealth Rock takes a quarter of their health, then Sandtrash tanks their Flame Wheel living in the red. His Bulldoze does good damage and lowers their speed. And with that, Sandtrash lives to see another day and switches to Peekmore, who's immune to the heat. Yeah, nothing she isn't used to. The dog was certainly no match for her. Thanks to our immunity, G-Max Santa Scorch can only hit us with a resisted Max Flutterby. And even though it does significant damage, we're safe to stay in and land a Paralysis with Lick before barely living another. You know, other than a crit. <laughs> with that, Surfurch, my far-fetched, simply tags in and cleans up the fight with Aerial Ace. I was fully expecting some deaths there, but wow, with a win like that, I really feel like this could be my first ever deathless run. Gigantamax Gengar is now on the horizon, and that thing's a monster. I really hope we get some hits here. Ooh, okay, Dynamax on my Dratini at any point is nice. Snom and Pinsir are the other draws, and honestly, I welcome Pinsir with open arms. Fully evolved basics are kind of my saving grace here. Next we've got Grimer, does it count? <laughs> Articuno EX, yo! Uh, Rhyhorn who could evolve, and an old Amber, and Slowbro. So now I've got two cards I could trade the Articuno for. I could get the Aerodactyl from the old Amber, the Slowpoke for the Slowbro, but I think I'm gonna commit to the Dragonair card since I could Dynamax them now. I'll save the second trade for later, just in case. The team's looking pretty okay now. Definitely a little patchy. And on the way to Alistair, Ponderp actually puts in pretty great work. Showing off in front of a team of more evolved Pokemon is really something. Except for Peekmore. No one could show up Peekmore. My newest bug leads the fight against Alistair's Yamask. One Thief almost does them in, and after Disable, we take them out with Pin Madam's... Hooves? Anticipating an ancient power from Cursula, I pivot to Wubwu, who's actually my most specially defensive Pokemon right now. Because we're faster, our payback doesn't get the kill, but they crack under the pressure and just finish the job themselves. Okay. Peekmore is my answer to Mimikyu. Unfortunately, we switch in on a baby doll eyes and get hit by a crit slash before lowering their defense with fire lash. After that, we trade a couple more hits, and because they hold on, Peekmore could very quickly meet her maker. I'm forced to tag in Wubwu, who ends up stealing the kill. I'm sorry, Peekmore. You'll be back. But, uh... But not for the Gengar. Once again, for those unprepared, this Gengar can easily win the entire fight on his own. Trapping you in with its max move and boosting its special attack with its other max move, luckily I could easily stall out his G Max turns by predicting each attack and switching in accordingly. Pawn Air for the max oozes and Surf Urge for the max Phantasm. Well, Surf Urge takes the max darkness, but 
<laughs> he's fine. When the max turns in, Ponder gets put to sleep by hypnosis and takes a nasty hex. But she just wakes up the same turn to get some payback. Honestly, who even needs evolutions? Let's go, Ponder! The next card packs don't have too much, sadly. Weedle, Lilligant for later, Jinx, Minchino, <laughs> you two EX? That's two more cards again, and I think I'll save them too. The next pack is also alright. Notably, there's a Psyduck that I could evolve, and hey, a Sinchino! Opal's badge was supposed to be very easy. Not only does she give stat buffs if you answer the questions correctly, but Ponerp has the perfect typing to allow us to stall her wheezing and get every single buff. But sadly, the last trainer guarding her arena wanted to make sure that never happened, and crits Ponerp with Dazzling Gleam, staining our run, making it no longer deathless. The crit actually mattered here, even with us unevolved, and this was extra sad, because Ponyrp was very quickly becoming my favorite Pokemon of the run. Other than Peekmore, maybe in another life, Ponyrp. Instead of executing the setup strategy, we're just gonna be running and gunning now. Lola, who I couldn't rename, leads strong and psychics the Weezing before they even realize. Mawile comes in, so that means the return of Pwn Dashi. The defense drop from Crunch is a little unfortunate, but with the Eviolite, we're able to safely attack the next turn. And we could stay in for the kill, but I decide to switch to Wubwu. Reason being that this is the turn we get the defense boosting question. So Wubwu's body count very quickly increases by 2. And the defense boost goes an even longer way, because Wubwu is very safe to stay in and get some chip damage on the G-Max Alcremie. But without any super effective moves, it's only a matter of time before Peekmore tags in and saves the day. See Peekmore? I knew you got it! A couple more packs means a couple more hits. That's what that means, right? I finally pull Kingler, which means Crabbler can evolve. Helioptile joins and can evolve as well. Oh, <laughs> another full art Dragonite? I mean, it's cool, I guess. Then in the next pack, I pull a Poliwag, and Clawbola can evolve as well. All right, it really sucks that Ponerp is gone, but the run will live on stronger than ever. We just got another gym badge. So you guys know what that means? Hop's going through a phase right now, as the community doesn't understand him. So his team is looking a little nasty. Peekmore takes out the lead Trevenant with ease, and that brings in Intalion. Before, my checks for him were Ponyrp and Pinmatum, but now that they're evolved, it's a bit scarier. Lolo can at least come in on a couple baby doll eyes and then do a little damage with Energy Ball before tagging into Heliotisk on the predicted Sucker Punch. From there, Thunderbolt easily finishes them off. Then it's Clawblock's turn to shine as he deals with the Snorlax. Hop reveals his own version of Peak, but cheap imitations could never live up to the original. Might have been nice for me to use my own Peak more here, but Crabbler wanted to stretch his legs. And Claws. Last Hop has Bolton, but even being unevolved, Ripeardorn is a free counter and finishes off the fight with ease. Perhaps Ponyrp's legacy can live on. If you weren't already convinced that Peekmore is among the best Pokemon ever made, she just about single-handedly solos the entire gym fight against Melanie. Frostmoth, Darmanitan, Ice-Q, none are a match for this Anteater. But, fine, I'll draw the line at Lapras. Lilla enters in on an immune Max Geyser, and shows that having dry skin isn't always so bad. She outspeeds and puts the Lapras to sleep with Lovely Kiss, only for them to take a single energy ball and wake up the next turn to use Max Resonance. Their G-Max is over now, and nothing stops Lola from just putting them to sleep again. With that, Crabbler tags in. I went to him because if Lapras wakes up, he'll resist her moves the best. I planned correctly because they do wake up, but a couple brick breaks removing the Aurora Veil is all it takes, and victory is ours. Lately while I've been opening the Mewtwo packs, I've been feeling like I've been getting too many duplicates, and decided to give up on the Gardevoir dream, among others. I switch it up from here and begin opening Charizard packs. The first one is... fine. Machamp and Tauros are the only real pulls, and in the next pack, I finally find another bent one, and pull Tangela, Pukumuku, Send a Scorch, and Poliwrath. Okay, we've got some bulk in the first two, and we do have Poliwag already. Again, Hop wants to battle, 
but since his character arc is resolved and he's less sad, his team is easier to beat and his lunch money is all mine. However, this fight got me way too comfortable, because in no way was I ready for Team Yelgrunt number 17. Tortanx doesn't quite have the best coverage yet since I just got her, but it's not her fault. A stab horn attack is fine. The only problem with my plan was that I had no idea that Linoon had counter. Well, when it rains it pours. Man, that Intimidate would have been amazing for Raihan too. Piers, it's a really good thing you're a gym leader, because I am not moved by this performance at all. I decided to go with Crabbler for the lead, but Scrafty's Intimidate and sizable payback damage forces me to switch into Clobalock. They get a cheeky sand attack off, but Clob stays focused and lands a fatal brick break. Malamar is simply seasoned seafood for a pin madam, who knocks them out with the four times effective X Scissor. Next is Obstagoon, and oh, what do you know? He has counter too. Huh. Well, as long as you have a special attacker, you're usually good to go. And boy, do I ever. What do you guys know about Peakmore? Okay, well, she's not quite enough this time, so Heliotisk tags in to finish the job. But don't you forget who did most of the work. Last is Skunk Tank, and my headcanon is that this Pokemon was supposed to have a G-Max form, but they didn't make it in time, just like Flygon's Mega. So Pierre's is now like, nah, I don't really need a Dynamax anyways. Anyways, Repyrdorn is a massive counter to Skunk Tank, so we're all done at Spike Muth. Alright, I'm feeling pretty good about these next couple of packs. Uh, Vulpix could be okay, and Kadabra and Alakazam is a nasty combo. Then, <laughs> oh, we take Charizard EX, no problems there. I still have three available trades, and could get G-Max Charizard right away for Raihan, but I don't think I need to use all those just yet. However, due to the loss of Tortanx, I do finally redeem my second traded card from the Articuno EX for Poliwhirl. Letting my Poliwag evolve all the way to the Poliwrath from before. This extra bit of water and fighting should be just what we need for this double battle. I know Kabu gets a lot of deserved hype for his place in the early game, but I firmly believe that Raihan is objectively the hardest gym leader here. His Pokemon cover each other's weaknesses pretty well, and it might not be so much as to make the gym impossible or anything, but it does make the preservation of my buddies a little tough. Raihan sends out Flygon and Gigalith, immediately setting up the Sandstorm. In return, I send out Crabbler and Saigol to go on the full offensive. The biggest threat at the start is Flygon's Thunder Punch, but either Pokemon should live one. Then, surprisingly, both of Raihan's Pokemon get one shot by Ice Beam and Liquidation, respectively. Honestly, I was not expecting Gigalith to go down in one hit. This honestly works against me, because ideally, I take out the Gigalith and the Sandaconda at the same time which would leave Duraludon on the field alone. After they use Gigantamax, G-Max Depletion hits Saigol for roughly 60%. We heal with a Citrus Berry, and double up with Scald and Brick Break for massive damage. Sadly, the burn doesn't activate, and Saigol gets paralyzed with Glare. So, I end up switching him to Tangeloaf. Crabbler stays in to eat the next Max Rockfall, before healing up with his Berry, and one-shotting the Sandaconda with Liquidation, you know, I feel like a lot of people keep forgetting about the Crabbler. After Crabbler wastes Protect and Tangeloth eats a Depletion, we're lucky enough to land a Sleep Powder. Thanks to Tangeloth all but assuring our victory, Crabbler is more than safe to land one more Brick Break, winning us the fight. I bet you guys are glad I traded for the Poliwhirl, huh? Double battles are really touchy. If Duraludon committed with Max Steel Spike and got a few defense boosts, there's a good chance that I wouldn't be able to break through. But we take those, and it's pack opening time. This isn't the last time I'll be opening packs for the run, so I'm not feeling too worried just yet. I still get some pretty nice options to work with here too. Machop is the only real newbie in the first pack, but in the second one, I get both an Abra and Patilil, which gives me full access to those evolutionary lines now. Nice. But it's time to show off one of the random NPC fights. And you know what that means? Yup. Someone dies. Route 10 ends with a handful of mandatory trainers, similar to the victory roads of previous games. The last two are particularly annoying, as it's a double battle, and they don't lead the way I read it from Bulbapedia. Long story short, Repyrdorn can't get the kills he should thanks to some sand attacks, 
and Peekmore switches out early to avoid overleveling. As a result, along the way to escaping the paparazzi, Chilcino takes the hit for the team. She didn't deserve it, but the Para and Miss RNG put in crazy work. I was fortunate to go out with only one death, honestly. But man, is the Deathless Dream really that impossible for me? With that, we finally make it to Winden, a section of the game with high highs and boring lows, and we get to start it off with two final rival fights. Just like last time, I'll be treating Marnie and Hop as an Elite 2 and commit the same team of 6 for both fights. I still feel like I have a team of underdogs, even after all this time, but with the help of Crabbler, Clobalocked, Peekmore, Pin Madam, Ripeardorn, and Patiligent, anything is possible. Against Marnie, I lead with Clobalocked, hoping for a quick one shot. However, we protect immediately in hopes of negating some early chip damage from Fake Out. Marnie reads that and sets up a nasty plant, but for some reason they just use Torment after, so they soon fall to Brick Break after all. With Scrafty out, we can work around the Torment by using Protect every other turn, and pretty soon Scrafty shares the same fate. We don't really have a counter for the Toxicroak, but that's where Pin Madam comes in. Their poison type attacks won't be doing much to us, so a faster high horsepower does the trick, along with another one to deal with the more Peko. This little Gen 1 bug is often in the shadow of Heracross, but she certainly deserves some respect. Marnie's Grimmsnarl enters his G-Max form and slams the switched in Ripeard on with a G-Max snooze. We tank it this well thanks to the Eviolite, but oh man, I forgot about the Drowsy effect. Either way, we gotta stall out their hits, so we use Protect on their max Starfall, which sets the Misty terrain and prevents us from sleeping. Okay, interesting strategy. Rapierdorn then takes one more attack before exchanging it for an Earthquake. Since our health is so low, and we're slower, we need a hero to tag in and clean up this fight. And who other than Peekmore? They hit us with the Darkest Lariat on the Switch, and bulk up the following turn. But Peekmore simply uses Flamethrower, and effortlessly wins us the first match. Sorry Marnie, I think you forgot your counter to peek. The final stand against Hop begins with Pin Madam and Dub Wolf. Pin Madam is my lead of choice because she's able to power through the Cotton Guards they set up thanks to Stormthrow's guaranteed crits. Corviknight only really has one thing that could threaten my team, and that's Swagger. However, Peekmore is no stranger to Swagger and perfectly counters the public transit with ease. It's a similar story for the Crabbler, whose insane defenses help him wall the Snorlax, at worst getting hit by the neutral hammer arm. Pinkurchin comes out next, but boom bada bing, Ripeard Orn takes care of him. Last we've got Hop's Dynamaxing Inteleon, and I considered bringing Lola along to eat their max geysers with dry skin, but instead I brought Patiligent, who I thought could handle them. We take a little more damage from max geysers than I was anticipating, and we'll surely die to a max hailstorm now. I was hoping we could use Sleep Powder or Giga Drain, but instead I just protect their next hit. Crabbler can now, without a doubt, eat the next baited max hailstorm, and switch to Clobalocked on a very predictable and resisted Dark Pulse. Clob eats a Snipe Shot that almost takes him out, but that's the last attack he'll have to take, because once he brings him to the red with Brick Break, nothing stops him from taking the kill with a priority feint marking us the victors of the Winden semi-finals. The only sad result of these fights is the realization that this is the last time we can open any card packs. These two are going to be it for the game. I actually got two bent packs as options for the first pack here, and in the bendier pack, I immediately see a hit. Farfetch'd, Ducklet, Swana whatever, then Meltan? And after that, full art Charmander, baby, woo! I found another slightly bent pack for the final pick, but sadly, there's nothing new or usable there. Knowing all the cards that are at my disposal, I finally know what I want for my last two trades. First, I'll get a Charmeleon card to complete the Charmander line, and hey, let's make it a shiny, why not? And finally, I'll use my last freebie to get Melmetal. I know it's technically a legendary, but hey, come on, I never get to use this thing. And it's like my favorite mythical. Besides, I'm playing on official hardware. I even go out of my way to catch a million Meltan on Pokemon Go. Evolve it and transfer it. Also, it never gets double Iron Bash before Leon anyways. So I think I've earned this. 
Alternatively, Meltan could be considered a legendary and give me a freebie, but its pull rate is way higher than a real legendary's. I don't think I'd get any trades. The rest of the tournament is suddenly put on pause as I have to deal with Team Macrocosmos. Ooh. You think I'd deal with this onslaught of steel types with my new shiny Charizard or even Peekmore? But instead, I use Meltatelt because they're shiny in their own way. And Poliwag because of something something sunk cost fallacy. Something something. It culminates with a fight against Oleana that has some solid type diversity, but it's still pretty simple all things considered. Peekmore easily fries the Frostlast, Meltatel Thunder punches the Milotic to death, Crabbler liquidates the Salazzle, and Charminzard eats a crit acrobatics and another acrobatics before frying the Serena. Okay, I definitely shouldn't have risked that, but we lived! No lessons will be learned. Finally, Oleana sends out her G-Max Garboder, but Ripeardorn continues to be one of my most consistent Pokemon and stalls out the G-Max while putting on enough pressure to take them out as soon as they shrink. Sorry, Kabooey. No screen time for you. On to the full Winden Championship. I'll once again be committing a set team of six for every fight, even if the game lets me switch them out. This champion team consists of Pinmatum, Ripeardorn, Poliwag, Patiligent, Charmizard, and Meltatel. I definitely got some heavy hitters this time around, but one slip up will be more than enough to end the run. Let's make sure that doesn't happen. The first fight is a surprise match against Bead. Whoa, 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 what's he doing here? I send out Pinmatum first to absorb the Intimidate from Mawile. Then I switch to Charmizard, who eats a player off before getting the first kill. Gardevoir enters on the receiving end of a Fire Punch and tries to heal it up with Wish. Unfortunately for them, another Fire Punch takes them out before the Wish can come true. Galarian Rapid Ash gets a free, albeit weak hit on Rhyperdorn on our Switch, and because their best move for us is Dazzling Gleam, it's only a matter of time before Smart Strikes strike them down. Last is Bead's Gigantamaxing Hatterene. There's gonna be a few more G-Maxes, heads up. Predicting their G-Max spite, or rather, anything that isn't a Max Flare, Meltatel enters and absorbs their first attack. Now with a Max Flare sure to come out, I switch to Charmizard, who tanks it the best he can. And now, thanks to them foolishly setting up the sun, Charmizard uses G-Max himself and Max guards their last big turn, and uses the sun to boost his G-Max Wildfire. It doesn't get the KO, but the chip damage finishes them off just as well. Yeah, I could have just led with Charmizard and G-Maxed earlier, but it would have felt weird. I wanted to use my other mons too. Nessa was surprisingly easy. I brought Patiligent in part to deal with her heavy hitters, including the G-Max Dreadnought, but Iron Fist Meltatelt is kinda crazy. Thunder Punch from this thing does crazy damage, and one-shots Nessa's first batch of Pokemon, no questions asked. Meltatelt is pretty slow, so the only way we could do this safely was with some classic Protect Leftovers stalling. We protect their first turn of G-Max, and take a hefty Max Darkness the following turn, while dealing our own bit of damage with another Thunder Punch. One more Protect very safely stalls their last turn of G-Max, and Poliwag tags in. Because she resists all of their moves, she effortlessly triumphs over the turtle. Let's go! I knew I would need Poliwrath at some point. Just as much as before though, Alistair's Gengar is very scary. But leading up to that matchup results in another Pokemon shuffle. Meltatel uses Darkest Lariat, which is almost double Iron Bash, along with Thunder Punch to deal with the Dusknoir. Charmizard's Shadow Claws aren't quite enough, so he eats a Shadow Ball before taking out the Chandelure. Poliwag Lariat's the Cursula into Dust, and then finally, even though Patiligent doesn't have a super effective move, the Sleep Powders do wonders, and she ends up the victor over Poltegeist. And now with Patiligent already out by the time Gengar appears, She's baiting a Max Ooze, which means Meltatelt is completely safe to absorb it. Then I expected G-Max Terror from Gengar, and planned on make a joke about, oh, you're trapped in here with me, and all that. But instead, they use Max Darkness on our Protect, which lowers our special defense. Of course, now a stab unprotected Max Terror would hurt Meltatelt a lot, and they're known for their physical stats rather than their special. But the special defense is still among the highest on the team, and I figured that, at our health, we could eat at least one hit. Sadly, that is not the case at all, and my Pokemon Go Pokemon, Pokemon goes to the Pokemon Great Beyond. In hindsight, I realize now that I didn't have another switch in at all for this thing. 
and should have maybe brought a normal type instead of Patiligent. At least I know for next time! Ripeardorn one-shots the Gengar, and it's as simple as that. I'm sorry, Meltatel. I have this thing where my legendaries always die, I, I don't know what it is. Trying not to dwell on the loss too much, I head straight to the arena to fight Raihan. Poliwag leads, but with the Torkoal immediately setting up the sun, we opt for Earth Power. It doesn't get the kill, but since we have a Rindo Berry to weaken their Solar Beam, another Earth Power is soon unleashed. Gudra threatens with Thunder, but because Raihan has this obsession with setting up the weather for some reason, we're relatively safe to use Ice Punch. Without Swift Swim, we don't outspeed, so instead I pivot to Patiligent to eat a resisted hit, and then to pin Madam. The Surf still hurts, but after a berry heals and protect stalls the rain, we actually outspeed and take down the Pseudo Legend. Obviously, Turtonator has an advantageous matchup here, but going off my weather theory, we stay in to land a high horsepower. But Raihan reveals that he was conditioning me all along. Instead of setting up the sun, Turtonator activates his Shell Trap. And after we land the super effective attack, the 200 base power bomb is set off, and Pin Madam is no more. When it rains, it pours, I guess. Ugh, man, Pin Madam was great! I can't believe I let that happen. Rest in peace, little bug. Charmizard enters the field to exact revenge, and G Max is right away to deal with the Flygon. I used G-Max Wildfire instead of Max Wormwind right away, so that I could get the Wildfire ready by the time Duraludon appears. It's a bonus when Raihan wastes a heal halfway through the plan too. We use our last G-Max turn to Max Guard and waste their turn of G-Max, and then switch to Riperdorn who, guess what, eats the remaining attacks. Even Max Steel Spike. Because they live in Earthquake after shrinking, I play it safe and switch back to Charmizard on a resisted body press. From there, we easily outspeed, and Flamethrower finishes the job. I honestly assumed the beginning part of this game was going to be the bloodiest, and I'm sure this run would still be deathless if I just planned a little bit more. But there's nothing left I could do now but charge forward and do my best to claim the victory. For them. Before we get to fight Leon, we've got one last interruption from Chairman Rose. However, unlucky for him, being free from the championship matches means that I can reunite with Peak who in fact solos Chairman Rose's entire team. Aside from the Kaparaja, but who's counting anyways? And lastly, we have to deal with Eternatus, but because the AI is a little random, the base form is dealt with by some clever pivoting, and the Eternamax form is simply dealt with by Rybeardorn. Fun fact, if you use Earthquake and kill the legendary dogs, they never come back. And with that, we've finally made it to the championship finals. I'm actually gonna take the back road to get there, I don't need all that commotion, I'm just a chill guy. Leon is honestly one of my favorite champion fights in the franchise. The buildup is unmatched and the battle is just fun. I could justify entire playthroughs of S.H.I.E.L.D. just to fight him, but the flattery won't make him go easy on me, so to answer his Aegislash, I lead with none other than Peak. Even in their defense form, they stand no chance and get taken out in one flamethrower. To be fair though, I don't think anyone would have stood a chance. Haxorus comes out, and thankfully, I read them correctly, because Charmizard just hovers over their Earthquake. They outspeed and land a nasty outrage, as we eat our berry and retaliate with Dragon Pulse. Unfortunately, it's not quite enough to take them out, so I switch to Ripeardorn. He still gets hit hard, and even takes a super effective Iron Tail, but Eevee like go burr, and we just get the kill with Ice Punch. Seismitoad then gets hard countered by Batiligent, who I'm now realizing has become a mainstay on the team. But she isn't so ready to deal with Cinderace. Fortunately, I think Leon has forgotten about the Crabbler. This will be his downfall, because with hardly even a single neutral attack for him, Crabbler is safe to use his new Crab Hammer for a solid elimination. Dragapult has a solid variety of moves, so I use Patiligent to pivot and absorb the obvious Thunderbolt. From there, I finally get to switch to Draytonite, a Pokemon who's been in the back pocket this entire time, but finally gets to shine. With the power of the full art, we Dynamax as soon as we can and avoid the para from the Dragon Breath. A Max Wormid easily takes them down as Leon sends in his own Charizard, turning this match into D-Max versus G-Max. Of course Leon's G-Max Charizard is faster, so we stall a turn with Max Guard in case things go horribly wrong but it turned out we had nothing to be afraid of. 
Their best move against us is Max Rockfall off of Ancient Power. And because Draytonite eats it like the champ she is, she returns the attack with her own Max Rockfall off of Stone Edge. Without any doubt, it gets the one shot, marking us victors of the championship finals, as well as the entire game. I don't know if anyone noticed there, but Peekmore was the only one to exit that battle without taking damage. Makes you think. Thank you all so much for watching today. I'm having a great time doing these Nuzlocks, and if any of you want to try this challenge on your own, let me know what changes you make to the rules. I'm sure there are a lot of things that could be done differently. Of course, just like with Pokemon Sleep, feel free to add me on Pocket. I'm playing that game pretty often, and I need to complete the decks before the expansions are released. Anyways, I won't take up any more of your time. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you've made it to the end. I'll see you all next time, and have a good one.